thank you for joining us today. The message that I'm going to be sharing here in just a few moments will serve as the basis for our in-person study on the following Sunday by the Truth Point Bible Church Congregation, which is a new church in Payson, Arizona. And uh, if you'd like to learn a bit more about us, there's some information displayed on your screen, mainly some QR codes. I would comment that we live stream uh, our services, our studies on Sunday. So with that, you have the opportunity to join in our conversation with your questions and comments shared online. And of course, if you live in the Basin area, we would certainly love to have you join us for our in-person services. In the midst of our most difficult times, it's easy to put things on hold. When suffering and pain are the most intense, we are easily drawn to focus almost exclusively on our painful experience. And pain can divert us from attention to things like our marriage, family, work, and, and spiritual disciplines like prayer, Bible study, and Christian fellowship. The original audience that the Apostle Peter wrote to were followers of Christ who were undergoing intense persecution and suffering. So these were not business as usual times for them, and perhaps they were tempted to draw into a protective huddle and neglect things that they would normally focus on in more, shall we say, normal times. And perhaps to counteract such thoughts and tendencies, the Apostle Peter writes and directs them to apply, as he says, all diligence in more fully developing and deepening their spiritual character. The same applies to us. Even in the most difficult of times, it is never the right time to neglect our spiritual growth. And the fact is, these are some of the times that are most conducive to that growth. Now, we are not left to fend for ourselves or grow through our own self-determination and personal will because we read here that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So all the resources that are needed have been made available and we are to apply all diligence in bringing these resources to bear in our lives. And we've also been given as we read precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. God has given us all the resources and the promises that we, might, uh, that we need so that we might literally partake of his very nature. Now outlined in 2 Peter chapter 1 are eight specific qualities that we are to give due diligence to in growing and deepening our walk with Christ. This process, as we read about, begins with faith, and this is faith, shall we say, in the faith, described in Jude 3 as the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. To this faith, we diligently add moral excellence, which is moral character or virtue, and then we diligently add to moral excellence knowledge, which is our focus today. Now, the word translated knowledge here that we read about comes from a Greek word gnosis, and it means to experientially know. It is a functional knowledge acquired through firsthand experience. We might say it is what we know through whom we know, namely an experiential knowledge of God through Christ Jesus. And Jesus summed it up very well in John 17, 3. He says, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, Jesus' statement here is monumentally significant on several levels. First of all, that eternal life is available through experiential knowledge of the only true God and his sent servant, Jesus the Christ. This eternally important knowledge is in accurately knowing who the only true God is and in who Jesus Christ is. It's vitally important that we apply all diligence in clearly understanding this vital truth. The Apostle Paul was one of the most knowledgeable religious leaders of his day, and his credentials were impeccable. He stated that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, 
as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But when Paul was confronted with the true reality, which is Jesus the Christ, he made this declaration, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And more than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of, notice this, knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. This knowing Christ, it is the exact same word used in 2 Peter 1 that we look at. It is an experiential knowledge. So Paul's religious book learning was vastly surpassed by the valuable personal knowledge of Jesus himself. Now, Jesus stated in John 5, 39 to the religious leaders of the day, he said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them, in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about me. So if Bible study is an end in itself, then we have missed the point. If we do not find Jesus the Messiah in our studies, then it has all been in vain. And someone summed it up very simply this way. The Old Testament tells us that someone is coming, the Gospels tell us that someone is here, and the New Testament tells us that someone is coming again. And that's a pretty accurate summary. There's an old saying that it's not so much about what you know as who you know. And this definitely is true as to the knowledge as we consider it here out of 2 Peter 1. Uh, we should be good and diligent students of the Bible, certainly. And we learn as much from 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. So we definitely need to know the truth of the Bible through careful and deliberate study. But as Jesus says, if we don't see them testifying to him, then we haven't really learned our lessons from our Bible study. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, we read, Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. The knowledge and understanding of Peter and John defied their apparent training, but the explanation was found in that these men had been with Jesus. We might say they had gone to school with Jesus for three and a half years, which incidentally and interestingly enough is roughly equivalent to the amount of time spent in a four-year college education. They had this experiential knowledge of Jesus. Now this same apostle John mentioned there was inspired to write these words when he wrote, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. To know God through Christ is to live out that knowledge through a life of obedience. And that life of obedience is summed up this way. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Now, knowledge and experience are sometimes viewed as opposites. In Christian traditions, there are the extremes of knowledge and experience. There are groups who place a very high priority on biblical intellectualism, as we might call it, and there are others who prioritize spirit experience almost to the exclusion of biblical knowledge. And neither extreme is good, nor is it healthy. Uh, there should be a rich mixture of both knowledge and experience if we are to diligently pursue the kind of knowledge that is in view in 2 Peter 1 that we look at here today. Now, one helpful illustration for us is in the example of music. We might imagine there is someone who's been thoroughly taught music theory and techniques but this individual's never actually played a musical instrument. In contrast, we have another individual who's never actually had any formal musical training, 
but has spent a considerable amount of time playing a musical instrument and learning music through experience. We would say that the second individual would likely be the better musician, but what would really be the best is for that first individual to actually play an instrument and for the second individual to combine experience with some formal training. And this ideal is what is needed in true knowledge as we've been considering it here this morning out of 2 Peter chapter 1. Both of these aspects of knowledge and experience are necessary to have the real knowledge in view here. 1 Timothy 2 verses 3 through 6 says, God our Savior desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony given at the proper time. It is the express purpose and desire of our Heavenly Father that all people be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And this truth knowledge is the same as what we read about earlier from Jesus in John 17, 3, to intuitively and experientially know the one true God and to also intellectually and experientially know his son, the one mediator between Father God and humanity, namely the human Jesus who gave his life as a sacrifice to save us. Again, we can relate this knowledge to the music illustration we shared a moment ago. It is not enough to know music theory. We must actually play an instrument. And it is not enough to know the doctrine of God and Jesus. We must actually know them through experience uh, concerning what we learn from the pages of the Bible. They both must be part of the package, so to speak. Applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge. These are stair steps to growth in our walk with Christ. These are not simple one and done accomplishments, but rather they are a process like cultivating a good garden. Deliberate and concentrated effort is needed to bring God's divine power to bear to cause these qualities to increasingly grow in our lives. And this really is fruit of the Spirit. We read about that in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Now these growth stair steps are not to be pursued through guilt-inducing legalism. And any perceived lack of progress ought not to discourage us, but rather positively encourage us to focus on that divine power available to bring about what we can never accomplish by our own will and determination. So what is set before us is not a burdensome obligation, but rather a great adventure opportunity. As we prepare to close our time in prayer today, I just want to leave you with these words, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's close our time today in prayer. Father God, I thank you for your divine power. I thank you for your precious promises through which we are able to take on literally the, your very character and nature. And uh, Father, we're thankful that you've made these resources available to us. What we need to become, we can never be through our own accomplishments and through our own will and determination. So Father, we know and admit that we are woefully short of what you desire and expect. But Father, again, we rejoice in the fact that you have provided everything needed for life and godliness. An amazing thought to think that what's needed is for us to take the resources with due diligence and apply them to our lives, to allow your work within us to accomplish, again, what we can never accomplish. Thank you for that. We are just so, so very grateful for it. But with that in mind, we think today of applying due diligence to applying the kind of knowledge that we need to have in our lives. And we've certainly come to see it is a knowledge of experience. It is a knowledge of a working and living relationship with you and with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we want to learn from the pages of Scripture, certainly. We want to be good students of the Bible. We want to go to the full extent of its purpose that we see Christ in Scripture 
and that we come to know him in a vital, uh, vital living relationship. Direct us ever along those lines that we might truly walk daily, moment by moment, Father, with you and with Jesus, our Lord. Again, we know that's the knowledge that you would have for us. And may we grow in that. And may we yield to your spirit to cause us to grow. And again, we are thankful for those resources. Thank you, Father, for these moments to to really focus upon your word and this vitally important knowledge that you would have us acquire in our lives. Direct us, give us wisdom, give us focus and determination that we might allow this to grow in our lives. Again, we thank you for these moments together this morning. Father, I personally thank you for each one who's joined. And I pray that this is truly beneficial to each of us in the process of growth. We thank you and praise you in the great name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our coming King. Even so come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. I thank you for taking time to share these moments this morning. I pray this has been productive and helpful to you as we've looked at God's timeless word and as we consider how we can uh, allow God's spirit to bring to bear this wonderful quality of an experience of knowledge in our lives. Again, I thank you for taking time to share with us, and I look forward to sharing with you again in a future time. Until such time, may God guide and guard and bless. So long and God bless.